Welcome to Engaging with Psychoanalysis. I'm Tom Schumann. I'm a mental health counselor interested in better understanding the theory, history, and practice of psychoanalysis. I aim to do so through discussions with practitioners, thinkers, educators, and others involved in the psychoanalytic tradition. If you're interested in being a guest on Engaging with Psychoanalysis, please email me at engagingwithpsychoanalysis at gmail.com. Thanks, and enjoy the show. This is the second half of my two-part discussion with Dr. Frank Summers about the societal value of psychoanalysis. So I was uh, I was just listening back to our conversation from Wednesday, mm-hmm. and it seemed like where we ended was uh, a conversation around the nuclear self, around the mm-hmm. most authentic core self. Mm-hmm. And, uh, okay. That really picked my interest. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. so much of what has kind of originated in the world of psychoanalysis and then has gotten ported over to other uh, ways of viewing psychopathology uh, talks about self but never defines it. Like, you know, if you look at the DSM, And it talks about borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder. It'll talk about these deficits in self Mm -hmm. with no context. Uh, (laughs) So, uh, you know, I've come across and I've been, I've encountered um, Mm -hmm. certain conceptions of what self is, but I'm wondering what, what it means to you. Okay, sure. I mean, First of all, um, you're right to bring up the point because self is used in so many different ways, you know, uh, in psychoanalysis and often not defined, you know. Um, To me, self means ways of being and relating, okay? Mm. Very simply, um, that's how I define it. Um, I think that's, you know, now, you know, you, you can certainly pick away at that, that definition if you go deep into it, because, you know, we all have different ways of being and relating, right? There's no one way of being and relating. So, um, you know, but we all have patterns, right? Like, um, um, I could say that uh, I have a, a pattern of uh, relating to people in a particular kind of way, um, or, um, you know, I have certain preferences that I live uh, according to those preferences, you know, you, you like movies or you like uh, going to sports events or you like um, traveling or whatever. Those are ways of being and relating, okay? And so they're all aspects of the self, okay? But um, there is, I think, for all of us, um, this is where it gets trickier, I think, it is where for, with all of us, there are certain ways of being and relating, that are much more crucial to who we are than others, okay? So, you know, I like to travel, but I wouldn't say it's part of my nuclear self. It's not what defines me, it's who I am, okay? And those are the ways of being and relating that matter most to us, where if we live in accordance with those things, we feel we're more, most authentically ourselves, okay? Mm. Um, like I've heard a number of musicians say that when I'm really into my music, when I'm really playing uh, the way I like to play, and it really is coming out the way I want it to, I feel that's how most myself, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, That's for them. That's people who are musical. I'm not. But um, the um, ways that matter most to me uh, may be very different, obviously very different for different people, right? But but that's how I define what's called, what Cole had called the nuclear self, what Winnicott calls the true self, what um, um, Bolas calls uh, destiny, your destiny, uh, as opposed to your fate. Um, the, there's certain ways that, you know, uh, we live with, you know, and that we, that we almost can't live without, that if we don't have them, we can survive, we can exist, but we feel alienated from who we are, okay? Yeah. So the ways of being and relating that matter most, that feel most authentically who we are, that's what I call the nuclear, the true self, okay? As opposed to 
lots of ways of being and relating that are all aspects of ourselves, but but not the central, the core to who we are. And in line with, you know, what we had talked about uh, in the first half of our, our conversation, that is something that can't really be quantified. Right. Uh, right. And I'm thinking yeah. if we, as a society, were to value these mm-hmm. qualitative mm-hmm experiences uh, you know we would probably structure things so differently i mean so much of how work worked Mm -hmm. at that point would probably be based around Mm -hmm. what kind of work are you most inclined to do at this core level Mm yeah yeah no you're right you're right on target i mean if um i don't know if i don't want to interrupt you is it no okay um yeah, I mean, you, what you're defining is alienation, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you, if work is, you know, like it is for most of us, for most people, you know, what you have to do, irrespective of what's authentic to you, right? Your work is alienating, mm-hmm. you know? This is what Marx said. This is that capitalism, he thought, was inherently alienating because the work had nothing to do with who the person is, you know? Yeah. Um, now, you know, whether you buy Marx or not, whether you buy critique of capitalism or not, it's irrelevant to this discussion. The point is that work that does not express uh, your authenticity um, is alienating, inherently an alienating form of work. Um, I'm, as an analyst, I'm of the opinion that people are happiest when their lives are lived according to what they feel is most authentically them. In other words, if your work expresses who you are, you're a happy person, okay? Whatever else is going on. It's not just your work. I mean, your life. I should. I want to broaden it out. To if your life expresses who you are, work being one part of that, of course, important part, but not the only part, okay? Um, and so um, to get it down to work, which is your question, um, yeah, I mean, if we were to take quality of life seriously, then we would say that work should be designed so that each person in their work expresses who they are in what they do, okay? You know, you often hear people say, well, this is what I do, it's not who I am. And, and that's true, but that also, what they don't, not aware of is that defines a kind of alienation, okay? Uh, if your work is what you do and it is who you are, that's the happiest form, I think, of human existence. Again, I would broaden it out and I'd say, if, if what you do in your life work and other things, work and personal life or whatever, expresses who you are, that those are the happiest people. Um, and, uh, you know, I think um, we don't pay any attention to that. That's not part of how our society operates. It doesn't operate on the basis of, you know, well, let me find what's authentically for you, you know, and we'll find the best work for you. You know, it doesn't operate that way. It operates on the basis of, well, this is what we do to make uh, the best profit we can make and if you want to join if you have a contribution to make to contribute to our profit that's great then then we love you and you're you're doing what we want and then you'll get we might get well rewarded for it right but it's inherently alienating if it doesn't have uh, authentic expression which never gets into the mix of how we think of work okay? uh, work is not um something that um, that we think of as an expression of the human being. Now, it is for some people, but it is not as a societal value. I don't hear it as a societal value. Um, but, you know, people who generally tend to be artists, musicians, uh, academics sometimes, um, will tell you that they're looking for meaning in their life, right? And that their, their art expresses who they are, or their music expresses who they are. Um, and there are a lot of people who do work uh, for which may not be very well compensated, but they're doing what matters to them. They're doing something that means something to them. And that's, um, that's non-alienated work. You know, that's, that's work that makes them satisfied. It's gratifying. What's gratifying about it is it expresses an authentic value of themselves. It expresses who they are at core, you know. Um, 
But unfortunately, I think for most people, that's not the case. Um, and it's, this is a, it's the tension in society. I mean, it's not like it's a resolved issue by any means, because um, I can't tell you how many people I see in my practice who are unhappy with what they're doing. Uh, and it's for this reason that we're describing here. Um, you know, and, and I'm not talking about people who are necessarily poor. It, it cuts across uh, socioeconomic ranges. You know, you can be very wealthy and be live an alienated existence. In fact, a lot of wealthy people do because they do what they do because it makes them a lot of money and that's the values in which they were raised and that's what they thought was important. And it does allay a lot of anxiety to feel like you have sound economic base, but it creates a lot of other tensions, anxieties for people if what they're doing has no meaning to them. You know, and I can't tell you how many people I've seen, you know, who have very well-respected uh, middle-class jobs, you know, lawyers, uh, business people, um, you name it, you know, who, um, who are doing well, they're successful in societal terms, but they're not successful in terms of their own happiness and gratification in life. And those are the pe people who, who often come in and say they're depressed, they don't know why, or they're anxious, and they don't know why. And they're, they're what they do mostly for most of their life is something that's uh, that's alienated from who they are. And, and of course, once you're involved in a profession, you know, and you've got a family to raise and you're, you're making good money, it's very difficult to make a shift, to make a change. Some people do, but it's more, it's more the exception than the rule. By that same token, I th you think of uh, clients who, mm -hmm find their jobs very alienating, very deadening. But because of their economic position, don't have any wiggle room to, you know, search out work that is more mm -hmm. in line with their core self. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, let's face it, it's a nice filled world, you know. Nobody guarantees you anything in life. We're all told that from the very beginning, you know. And so, you know, you grab onto what you can and you're happy to have a job because it means you can put food on the table, right? And you're, you're glad that you can do that. Um, but then, um, you know, and I'm not saying I don't understand that. I understand it very well. I understand the anxiety that leads people to, to grab what job they can because that's, you know, how they can feel that they've got a to shelter and they've got food. Um, but we can never forget or, or ignore the fact that it's an alienated way to live. And it leads to a lot of um, inherent dissatisfaction in their lives. And it leads to a lot of um, obvious symptoms, not only depression, but um, alcoholism, um, drug abuse. I mean, why are these things so prominent in our society? Why is gambling addiction so prominent now, you know, and only growing? You know, um, to me, these are all symptoms of, of what we're talking about. The people living lives that they do not feel are theirs. They do not put, feel in possession of their own lives, their own destiny. Right. And, as, you know, like as you're presenting it, mm -hmm. at least a significant mechanism in that is the quantitative view of human life and human experience. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. But that view being adopted mm -hmm. has to have some function, not a good function necessarily, but um, I, I, I'm, you, know, you, you had mentioned that psychoanalysis can benefit society by challenging that, by challenging mm -hmm. uh, that view of human experiencing, but there's that will be pushed back, pushed back upon. Um, right, of yeah. course. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, it'll be pushed back upon because it because it runs counter to the dominant values of the society. You know, um, but um, you know that's why I say that there's a there's a constant tension. I think. You know, um, I think that um, 
people are interested when they're first, a lot of people when they're first getting out of school and they're looking for a job and they're trying to make a living and trying to make their way in the world, um, are looking at things very quantitatively. You know, how much money can I make, you know, and how can I increase that uh, to live, you know, a comfortable life? Um, and it's not just comfort. People will say it's comfort, but it's also, there's a, it's a side, it's the value of society puts on success. So quantity is a, is a way of measuring your success. I had a, a patient once who was a lawyer who used to say, you know, I don't really care about the money per se, but it's the only way I know to keep score, you know? And, and that's what it is. It's keeping score, you know? Um, okay, I made, you know, so much more this year than I made last year, so I feel like I'm doing better, you know? Um, th that's how people keep score. It's the value society has as well as the, the material things it can bring you. Um, and, um, you know, when you decide that that value system uh, hasn't gotten you where you want to go, it hasn't made you happy, it hasn't given you a gratifying life, and you decide you have different values, what do you do then, okay? Um, there's inherent pushback in the society, right? Um, what company is going to hire you on the basis of, I want a job that's qualitatively gratifying to me, you know? I mean, they'll laugh you out of the office, right? Um, so, um, yeah, there's, there's pushback, there's inherent pushback by society and those who decide they're, they've had it and they want a different, um, uh, kind of value system to live by, um, they tend to live alienated from the mainstream of society. They may feel much more integrated for themselves, but you know, they decide they're going to do something that's more creative and more interesting to them. And it's not going to make them the kind of money, you know, that the old one did and then there are people who make enough money that they feel freer you know to to do something more creative or something that fits better uh with who they are you know that authentically it, it it feels like it's much more an expression of themselves um but not too many people ever get to that point you know where they make enough money they feel they've got that freedom and just the fact that you feel like you have to make a certain amount in order to feel the freedom to be yourself uh, that's already an alienated form of life, you know? So um, the um, structure of the society is such that because of the way it is, because it's um, with, with the values it places on quantification, objectification, and materialism, um, those values are always going to run counter to somebody who's interested in le leading a life that's qualitatively gratifying to them. If you're lucky, the two may coincide, but that doesn't, you can't count on that. You know, um, you're, you're running in opposition to the dominant values, which is why I say in, in my, uh, the, my the last book I wrote, which is called The Psychoanalytic Vision, um, I make a point in there of saying the psychoanalyst is inherently revolutionary. And not even revolution, actually rebellion is a better word. It, I, I relate the psychoanalyst to Camus' concept of the rebel, who is um, living according to um, principles, values, okay, that uh, are not determined by the historical circumstances in which you live. You know, a willingness to live in opposition to those circumstances and those values. Um, that's what Camus, how Camus defined the rebel. Okay, and uh, I feel like anybody who practices psychoanalysis is a rebel because you're operating on a different set of values from the dominant society. There's inherent uh, rebellion in being an analyst, you know? which is why it's not a popular thing, you know, and why it's kind of scoffed at by a lot of mainstream society. Although, um, interestingly enough, a lot of those people who would scoff at it one day uh, the next day or the next year may find themselves seeking that kind of help themselves, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think I, I, I could probably put myself in that camp. And uh, <laughs> as an undergrad, I was pretty uh, skeptical of mm -hmm. psychodynamic thinking. Uh, partially, uh, that's how we're trained to be in uh, undergraduate psychology courses and mm -hmm. a lesser extent in uh, uh, master's level training. But um, but, but let me just comment on that, because that's a really important point, I think, and it's a point I make in my book also, that um, 
the one field that you would expect to be an counter in opposition to the dominant values of society is psychology. And instead, academic psychology has bought the dominant societal values, hook, line, and sinker. It's completely sold itself out to those values. And as a result, it has nothing to say about human experiencing. Academic psychology is, is in itself a completely alienated form of academia. It does nothing for um, helping people understand themselves, under, understanding human experiencing. It does nothing. And it's so, you know, vituperously, contemptuously opposes and dismisses psychoanalysis, right? Meanwhile, it, uh, when you ask these people where they get their knowledge, where do they get it? They get it from studying animal behavior, you know? Okay, we got to know about learning. We got to know about cognition. So we'll study animals. But why are you studying animals? Well, because in animals, you can control them. You can do these things you can't do with people. So then how is that supposed to be related at all to human experience, right? It's, it's set up so that it can't possibly be related, right? It's the, the very uh, way it's approached is um, in the, uh, the assumptions on which it's based are that it cannot have anything to do with human experience. So I, I look at, at uh, academic psychology as primarily bankrupt, uh, intellectually even bankrupt, okay? because it will not face the fact that it cannot justify its own methods. Okay? You know, it's still based on, I don't, did I say this last time in the? Uh, yeah, 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 about Thorndike and, you know, that it's got to be, um, you know, if it exists, it could be measured, you know, that kind of thing. They can't justify it but they continue to operate on that basis while they claim to be scientists. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I just had to get on my high horse about <laughs> academic intelligence. You can obviously you can see how angry I am about it, you know? Well, yeah, I, I don't, I don't totally blame. I mean, you know, the, the I, I was a psych major for four years mm -hmm. and uh, with regard to psychoanalysis, there are, mm -hmm. you know, and you, you read a chapter about Freud. It's it's mostly full of misrepresentations. When you actually read Freud, mm -hmm. uh, you you see, mm -hmm. okay, that's that's not what he said, and this history isn't even lining up. Um, yeah, you know, one million uh, college students every year take introduction introduction to psychology. Many of them with the intent of becoming psychology majors. Very few end up being psychology majors uh, because they, they enter psychology because they think they're going to understand human beings, you know, and then they find out very soon they're following rats in mazes, you know, like I did. You, you did too, you know, introductory psychology. What do you do? You study, you know, uh, starving rats, how many times they'll press a button to get a certain thing, get a reward or whatever, you know, and so people drop out, you know, and they, they're not interested in it because it's not, it's totally irrelevant. It also, I mean, I, I, I think people hmm. prior to any uh, education in psychology have a much richer and probably more accurate uh, concept of what might be happening in the human mind. And you kind of get deprogrammed yeah. from this intuitive understanding of the richness of the psyche. Yeah, absolutely. You get deprogrammed. That's a good way of putting it. And it's uh, it, what they do is they um, they theoretically drop out everything that's of interest about the human psyche, right? And program you only to look at behavior, to look at what's externally uh, observable, which is, you know, the most superficial possible way. And it, it completely um, bl um, brackets out uh, anything having to do with the actual experience, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean... You're right. By the time you get done with a program in academic psychology, you have no, um, you have less probably intuition, understanding of human experiencing. Most people just who can relate to each other will understand human experiencing better than somebody trained in academic psychology, which is uh, really uh, tragic, but it's the way it is. Yeah. And I don't see any, I don't see it changing. It's like it's going the wrong direction. The worse they get, the worse they get. When you had mentioned the idea of uh, the psychoanalyst as rebel, um, mm -hmm. it made me think of 
kind of the inverse of that would be like traditional cognitive therapy where mm-hmm. it, it's it's really mm-hmm. like uh of back of ellis where it's really it's stoicism it's it is mm-hmm. uh make peace with the world as it is and uh, and bend yourself to it right right um and, and as far as i understand it, with the eventual m- m- uh marriage of cognitive and behavioral therapy mm-hmm. it seems like research suggests the behavioral therapy the, ex- the experiential stuff is doing all the heavy lifting mm-hmm. but when you are taught cognitive behavioral therapy when it's presented it they always lead with the cognitive part with the traditional mm-hmm. like uh, the mm-hmm. you know if if you're if mm-hmm. you're uh, if you're tied to a wheel going through town go mm-hmm. limp so you don't break any bones yeah and, uh, that seems very conducive to the way society is set up. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're you're right on target there with the, you know, it's like um, stoically bend yourself to get along in society. That's what they teach you. Uh, And they refuse to acknowledge that they are um, basically training people to go along with to society with with given norms without examining what those norms are or whether it's good for people to do that right uh there's no questioning of any of that and again they call themselves scientists but these are questions they will not ask well, how can you be a scientist if you won't ask the questions on which your very theory is based or even acknowledge that it's a theory okay and you won't even just be able to justify that theory why should you get along with society why should you make your try to make yourself accommodating to a societal structure, okay? And is that really the right thing for you? They won't ask those questions, okay? And so how are they scientists? I regard them as, as pseudoscientists. It's a um, scientism, a, a, an effort to try to pretend at science, you know? Scientists ask questions, you know? They don't ask questions. In, uh, in, our previous episode, in a, a previous talk I had, I spoke with uh, Dr. Donald Carveth, and he had brought up a similar idea of uh, the um, the patient and analyst as revolutionary cell, and uh, to try to bolster the conscience as opposed to the societal super ego, societally uh, imported mm-hmm. super ego, um, and you know part of where that conversation went was that's that's a dangerous thing to do and there is this element of if that's getting well then Mm -hmm. there's an inherent risk in getting well there is inherent risk in getting well there is absolutely and and every analyst should be well aware that as the patient does better on their own terms that there's a risk there okay and that they're going to it's going to lead to confrontations with certain aspects of the real world, right? Um, vocationally, interpersonally, and in, in really in every way, you know, maybe economically, you know. And so we all have to be very much aware of that, you know, that I'm helping the patient to become themselves. And I have to also uh, make sure that I'm aware and make them aware if they aren't themselves um, of what the risks and dangers are, right? And how they can negotiate those. How can they can deal with those? That's why there's a constant tension between the um, authentic expression of one's existence and the society, right? There's always going to be some degree of tension. Now, you're never going to totally resolve it, but you want to try to reduce that as much as you can without um, compromising yourself. That's the key thing, to not compromise yourself. And uh, I think as an analyst, I have to always be aware that who the person becomes uh, may very well be risky in terms of who they want to be in context of a society that maybe doesn't value what they want, you know, and they have to be very well aware of that. And we talk about it and talk about what the risks are, what kind of confrontation they're going to get, you know, sometimes in very uh, simple ways, you know, you, you help a person uh, liberate themselves from, let's say, a pathological accommodation, you know, where they're always going along with everybody, you know, um, and to the, to the point where they begin to assert who they are and live a life that's more authentically expression of themselves. And I have to be aware 
and they have to be aware that this means they're going to come into conflict with a lot of things that worked on, on a superficial level, worked well for them. It was smooth. It was easy because they always accommodated. But now that they're no longer willing to accommodate, they're going to run into a lot of conflicts that they didn't run into before, right? So, um, you know, that's part of my job is to be aware of that and to, um, to help them try to find a way to negotiate. Yeah. And, you know, the, the initial topic was, was what does psychoanalysis have to offer society? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think you've outlined that well. Mm -hmm. I, I think the question kind of becomes how does psycho now like to, you know to to borrow a term from the marxists what's the praxis there like how like how do you change society mm -hmm. well obviously psychoanalysis does not change society um unfortunately i think society has had more influence on psychoanalysis than vice versa because you know psychoanalysis is not held in highest very high esteem these days you know it was uh, at one point you know more highly regarded than I think it is now. Although I think there's a resurgence, actually. I think recently it's more, um, you see a, a change back um, because I think people see that, you know, they're not getting anywhere with cognitive behavioral and these other things. And I think there's more of a movement back. But uh, to get to your question, um, how? Uh, not an easy one to answer. And I certainly don't have the answer, but I can give some of my ideas about it. Um, I think the first thing um, is to have psychoanalytic influences in the discourse of the issues that beset society you know there's never these days that i can see um in news programs or discussions and whether it's on radio tv or any other forum i don't see the um the uh, introduction of any kind of psychoanalytic thinking into issues that have so much to do with the human psyche you know um uh, I don't know how psychoanalysis actually can um, enter into the dialogue, but I think that's the first thing. It has to become part of the dialogue. If it isn't part of the dialogue, it's, you know, it's, it's not having any influence in society. Um, you know, one way we have influence is we help people. We help people get a lot better and feel better about their lives, and they become kind of the poster children of psychoanalysis, you know, telling their friends and anyone else who will listen how much psychoanalysis has helped them. But, you know, um, that's one way, but it, it doesn't help at a really great societal level. You know, there are people, there was a, um, uh, I can say this because it's a public, uh, uh, a very, very popular AM radio um, talk show host. In the days when talk show hosts were interested in discussing all kinds of issues and it didn't, it, it didn't mean you were right wing or left wing, you know, it wasn't political at all. He was just a, a guy who used to um, enjoy talking to people and at different, you know, the topics on his show, but he was extremely popular. I mean, a lot of Chicago listened to him. Uh, this is before the heyday of FM and, you know, contemporary technology. And um, he was not shy about telling people that he had gone through severe chronic bouts of depression in his life and that he credited psychoanalysis with helping him out of that uh, and making him a much more happy satisfied person and it made him so happy and satisfied that he eventually gave up his radio show you know? <laughs> <laughs> but he was on for years it wasn't like it was an abrupt thing but he decided you know uh, I want to do other things with my life you know but um, uh, anyway he used to say this so this is public um, so things like that do help you know but um you need, we need a more broader, more societal level than that, you know, because how many people even know that Wally Phillips was in psychoanalysis? You know, very few. You know, today, nobody even knows who he was, you know, much less knows he was in analysis. But um, the, um, I, I think that um, there has to be a way, and I'm not sure what the way is, to bring a psychoanalytic perspective to bear. And so much of what goes on today, I mean, the the phenomenon of what's going on just this week, you know, in politics, yeah. you know, I mean, what is that all about? So much of that is about psychological processes. I mean, the hatred, the venom that so many people have, what is that all about? I mean, that's where psychoanalysis can come in to the picture and, and help the society, not just 
demonize these people, which is easy to do, certainly. People who want to storm the Capitol and bring their guns in and shoot people or whatever else they want to do. Um, it's easy to to, um, dis- to dismiss them as thugs and criminals or whatever you want to dismiss them as. But that doesn't help anything. It doesn't get us anywhere. Okay, Psychoanalysis takes the approach of, yes, what these, what these people are doing is wrong, but we have to understand why. We have to understand what is it that there is this societal phenomenon that so many people feel this way. Okay? What's the basis of their hatred, of their racism? You know, um, racism is a, primarily a psychological phenomenon, and it has to be understood from the point of view of what is it that people get out of it? What's the gratification? Why are they racist? And and psychoanalysis has a lot to say about that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, that has to enter the dialogue. Granted, there are economic and social reasons why people are racist, but um, without the psychological perspective, you really don't have uh, a comprehensive way of approaching things like racism, um, any of the isms, okay? Ethnocentrism, anti-Semitism, any of those things, okay? Um, those need, that's where psychoanalysis can offer much. I'm taking just at the societal level of helping people to understand, bring it into the discourse instead of just dismissing this as a, a phenomenon that has to be opposed, which it does. It has to be opposed, but it has to be understood also. My guess, and, and, and I, I'm keeping an eye on the time because uh, I think we're coming up on... Seven minutes. Yeah. yeah uh, my guess is that it would have to almost offer its help aggressively. <laughs> <laughs> right. It would have to. But then how do you become aggressive enough to get in? I mean, I don't know how. I mean, I'm willing to be aggressive about bringing psychoanalysis into the public domain, but I'm not even sure what the road is to go down, you know? Um, I think uh, someone who has, you know, been a name for a while now, but it seems like now they're even making a bigger splash in the past couple of years is uh, Zizak. Zizak. Uh, I could say his name in my head, not as much coming out of my mouth. Uh, Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I I think through him, you start hearing people that talk about Lacan, and then there's this back to Freud. Uh, And I, 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 you know, I kind of think of his demeanor is so (laughs) intense and... uh, uh, they alienate a lot of people, and I, I just don't um, understand all the. I guess I do understand. You know, Zizek I think is popular because he's so outrageous. You yeah. Know? You know, and that's he doesn't understand, or maybe he does understand that his popularity comes from exactly the things that he's criticizing about society. You know, he makes a splash. He says something outrageous. Okay, and so then he becomes a big name and he becomes popular, right? But ultimately. What's the value of that? You know, it just makes him feel good. You know, he becomes a a hot shot and people follow him or listen to him or want to hear him speak. Okay. Um, But um, his, you know, his ideas about how, you know, you can, uh, we have to do the same things that they do, you know, that the bad guys do. We have to do the same thing. Now, how does that help anything? You know, how is that? He's colluding with the very things he claims to be criticizing rather than doing anything to provide an alternative. So unfortunately, yeah, Zizek's a name that's that's out there, but I don't think, in my view, uh, he does nothing that's of any kind of constructive um, part of reestablishing society in any other footing that I can see. So, in your view, it would there. It seems like there would have to be a compromise between a certain mm-hmm. a, a kind of tactful forcefulness of uh, yeah. Here are these are ideas you have to reckon with them. But yeah. without taking the same tract of yeah. uh, people yeah. who would make life mm-hmm. less rich. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, um, there is there are ways uh, of doing that. Um, of of I mean, people like it when you know when I talk to you know public gatherings of non-professionals, which I don't that often, I do whenever I have a chance, but you talk to people like, you know, I've done things like um, commented on movies, you know, um, that people watch the movie and we talk about it and I can put a psychological perspective to the movie. People love that. I mean, they love understanding. So why did this character do that? You know, why do people do things that they do? Uh, they love it if they get an opportunity, if they're exposed to it, get an opportunity to see what it is, you know. 
And and they say, well, what is psychoanalysis anyway? And I say, well, it's what we're doing right here. This is mm-hmm. psychoanalysis. This is what I'm offering you about understanding this movie. That's a psychoanalytic perspective. Oh, you know, I was on a, um, a very interesting um, a panel uh, a few years ago. Uh, there was a psychoanalytic fair in New York, which all the psychoanalytic programs had a kind of a booth, you know, and we had a panel um, to start the program. And uh, there were, it was free, so there were a lot of people able to come who were not normally be able to come to a professional conference or a lot of students and so on. And uh, I would say maybe a third of the audience was people of color. And um, we talked about psychoanalysis and the value of psychoanalysis to society and to individuals and what it really was today, you know. Um, and I gave my little spiel about uh, that he given as a part of my keynote address at a conference. But I called it uh, psychoanalysis in the age of Nikeism and the, the opposition between psychoanalysis and Nikeism, which is my term for contemporary society. And uh, after uh, the panel, all these kids of, of color came up to me and said, I never knew psychoanalysis had anything to offer. I'm really interested in it now. You know, um, I started a program when I was head of the Division of Psychoanalysis um, of the APA uh, for um, young people to learn about psychoanalysis. We call them psychoanalytic scholars. They come for a year and they get exposed and so on. And um, uh, I set aside uh, about a third of those spots for people of color. And um, they're always enthusiastic, almost universally enthusiastic once they get exposed to hear what psychoanalysis is about. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing. It's just how do you get there? How do you get this in front of people? Because once they hear it, they, they love it, you know? It's so inherently interesting, you know, to hear about what how, what makes people tick, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think we have like one minute left, maybe. <laughs> no, I think I think it's uh, you know it, it sounds like what you're saying is the way to offer it is to offer it, and, pe- yeah. and if people can see it, they'll want it. They'll want it. Yes, people are exposed to it. They're interested. Yes, absolutely. It's getting it out there to where people can hear what it is. You know, I mean, if, you know, an analyst had the opportunity to talk about what's going on right now in Washington and you get a different perspective from the political perspective and the other perspectives that are offered, mostly political. But you add it, not that those are wrong, but you add a psychoanalytic perspective and people get really interested to hear a different approach to what's going on.